three and a half million people live in that land. The greatest military force in the history of the world is headquartered there in the Pentagon. Uh, it's a pretty important hunk of land of, of 500,000 acres. Uh, and uh, Was that was Washington's homeland, the northern edge of Virginia. <laughs> Welcome back to The Kevin Roberts Show. I have an exciting episode. Well, it's at least exciting for me, and I think, therefore, it's going to be exciting for you. Those of you who are real aficionados of politics, which I would presume would be all of you, will know this guest I'm about to introduce. Maybe if you're on the younger side of the spectrum, maybe you know him less well, but I think a lot of you will be excited to know that a gentleman that I've just met, someone I'm going to consider a friend now, someone I've respected for a long time because of his intellectual acumen, Michael Barone. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, sir. And and for those people who've tuned in via video rather than just audio, they can see that you're you're dressed in a very dapper way with with burnt orange, which which tells me you got the memo about the University of Texas. Well, it's uh, it's fall colors as far as I'm concerned. I grew up in Michigan, north of Canada, Detroit, Michigan. Um, we were not reconciled to the annexation of Texas. And so uh, the color coloring thing is coincidental to Texas. I take back everything nice I just said about you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just kidding. Thanks for being here. You, you have a distinguished career. You're a senior political analyst at the Washington Examiner. You are a, a senior fellow emeritus at American Enterprise Institute. And for a lot of us, we know that you are, were one of the founders of the Almanac of American Politics. And I will tell you a story that you've uh -oh. not yet heard from me. Do you remember the def now defunct bookstore chain, Walden Books? Absolutely. So that was my first job. And first job, you know, outside of helping people, yeah, right. you know, in farms or whatever. So I'm 15 or 16 in high school and always had the closing night shift because I was at school during the day. And my job, while the manager was counting the money, because just being a 16-year-old kid, I couldn't be entrusted with the money, right, was to reshelve all of the books. And it, it was supposed to take you 30 minutes to do this, but I got it down to a science of doing it in 12 or 15 minutes so that I could preserve the remaining 15 minutes being a political junkie to read the Institute of American Politics. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a postscript to this story, Michael Barone, and it is, I did this for months. And finally, my manager, a very sweet lady, walked by one night and she said, I think you ought to buy it because you kind of wore it out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. So I felt like I've known you for a long time. Well, and, and, and thank you for your, not just your intellectual rigor, your love for history. We're going to talk about your, your most recent book here in a little bit, but also the, the gentlemanly manner in which you have gone through commentary about some difficult things. I know I can speak for a lot of people in the audience that we're grateful for that. Well, I, you know, I try to, I've, I've been writing and uh, doing uh, about politics and about uh, how other people feel about things. Uh, you know, we have a lot of people today that say, if you're not the same color as somebody else, you can't possibly understand what they feel. Well, for about 60 years, I've been writing for publication and for, pro for profit, and I hope you did finally buy the book. I, uh, I did. I, I've bought it at least a few times. That Almanac of American mm -hmm. Politics is really well, it's, and But I've been writing that, and part of that uh, in a country like ours is inevitably trying to understand people who are operating from different perspectives, have different beliefs, may have quite different points of view or similar on some issues, and to try and understand what makes them tick, what goes on, how this, uh, this you know, small d democratic, small r republican process works. And you got to understand people who are different from you uh, not just assert your own identity. So I've tried to do that. I try to be polite. I've tried to, in my Almanac American Politics, I'd write write-ups of each state and put in some of the history there. And, and the point of view that I came to was that each time I did this, and I was writing these over a period of 40 years, um, I operated from a point of view of how would I feel if I lived in this state and liked living in this state uh, and so forth. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I liked living in the flyover states. So uh, I think that that was worth doing because, you know, there are people in North Dakota who really like being in North Dakota and 
do good things in North Dakota. And we want people in each state to have pride in their state. That, 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 that is to say, that's helpful for them socially, culturally, as they build institutions. But it's also this one aspect of the system on which our, our country is based, federalism. How, how grave a problem is it that too many Americans have forgotten that reality, the importance of federalism? Well, it's, it's a problem that we, we've, we have a heritage in this country that's a very interesting one. Uh, it's also a heritage that goes back rather a while. And it's hard, uh, you know, um, you know, I'm now of an age where I can remember I was born during World War II. I did not do any commentary on Fox election, uh, Fox News on election night 1944, but that Fox News didn't exist then. Uh, and I'm not sure I was capable of the commentary, but uh, I was alive then. And, uh, you know, we were 70 some years, 80 years closer to the founding then than we were now. So uh, there were people alive in when I was born who were alive during the Civil War. Uh, there were people who, uh, you know, we still have some connections. So President John Tyler was born in 1790. One of President John Tyler's grandsons owns his house in Virginia. He's an elderly man now. Um, so there's a connection that goes back. But when I tell people that, they're astonished. How can this possibly be? Well, Tyler had two marriages. This was a younger son of a later marriage and so forth and so on. But And then, and to be clear, this is a grandson, not a great-grandson. A it, grandson. A grandson. A grandson of a man born in 1790. But 1790 is a long time ago. And I think one of the other things that's hard to imagine um, is uh, the revolutionary period, the early republic, is a little harder for us to get our imaginations into than the Civil War period. In the Civil War period, you have people, uh, you have trains, and they're important in the Civil War, as a matter of fact. You have the telegraph instantaneously transmitting information uh, in a way that, uh, that we can relate to. You had steel plants, uh, pr producing steel that produced locomotives and things like that. Uh, they were wearing clothes that we could imagine putting on and buttoning up and figuring out how to handle. When you go back to the revolution, when you go back to the colonial period and the period of the early republic, you don't have any of that. Uh, there, uh, you know, there are no trains. They're, they're trudging over the mountains. They're on horseback. They're uh, you don't have the telegraph, instantaneous communication. On the contrary, you have, you have huge amounts of uncertainty that goes on in a wartime period or in peacetime problems. You know, the, the, we, we ended the War of 1812 by signing the Treaty of Ghent, but that was 15, 18 days before the Battle of New Orleans because they didn't hear about it. News didn't get to them. Uh, and uh, we can't. We have very great difficulty imagining how we would wear those clothes and how we would have powder our wigs and things like that. It's it's just a period that's more difficult for us all to uh, put into our minds, and uh, it's uh, so. I think that that's one of the reasons. And I think the other thing is that um, this story uh, has a lot of heroic figures. It has a lot of people who uh, the revolutionary period, the const making of the Constitution, really extraordinary figures. Um, it's hard to appreciate how important they were. Uh, some of us ask the question, uh, how did a, a, a new republic with about uh, with three million some people come up with uh, leaders like Washington, Jefferson, Hamilton, Franklin, Madison, et cetera, uh, and the country of 333 million today comes up in the minds of some people with figures that are inferior to them. Um, it, uh, it, it, it's a little hard to stretch your mind around, so uh, we have to exercise our imagination if we want to get around it. and. Uh, when we do so, I think one of the conclusions we come to, at least I come to, is how lucky we are. Uh, we are 
proud of our heritage, not necessarily because we as individuals are just super and wonderful and have done everything great, but we're the lucky beneficiaries, the lucky heirs of some really extraordinary people and of some events that uh, were, you know, happened uh, as a result of contingencies that were very unlikely in some circumstances. Which, which offers, those offer a parallel to this age, we might argue any age, right? It is, but it seems as if in elementary school classrooms, college classrooms, perhaps because of the conceit of the bias of, of some of the instruction, that we're no longer drawing those parallels in a way that allow students to, to appreciate that. And I think that leads in turn to a lack of appreciation for the founding era generally. Well, it, 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 it's, it's hard for people to imagine it. And for those uh, for, for products of the academy and otherwise that want to divide the world into oppressed and oppressors, uh, the United States, which by so many measures is the most successful entity of the world, we are 5% of the population, 25% of the world's economy, uh, over half of the world's military capacity and so forth. Um, it's so big, so powerful, so successful. It's got to be an oppressor. And they're looking for oppressors all around. I, I think that's the wrong way to look. That's a wrong way to look at history, a wrong way to look at what's going on and what has happened in the past. So let me ask you a political question and then we'll, we'll get into the, the book specifically. Do you think that it is helpful for conservative elected officials or would-be elected officials to reference the American founding as often as they do, reference the Constitution as often as they do? I happen to think this is a good idea, but you can account for my bias, right? But the reason I ask that question, Michael, is sometimes I hear, particularly from younger people, even younger people on the political right, that while they appreciate the Constitution, of course, they appreciate the American founding, that those references are, are now lost. That's the word they use, lost on the American populace writ large. Well, if they're lost, maybe we should try and find them. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, you know, bringing some history into it is important. And uh, some of our great leaders uh, specialized many ways of bringing in history. When you think of Lincoln, he says, uh, all homage to Jefferson. He was actually a member of a political party that didn't really did not trace, you know, had seemingly been in opposition to Jefferson's party and so forth. But he, he ran there. Franklin Roosevelt, uh, not a favorite necessarily at the Heritage Foundation. Not, not usually. But, but Well, but he also is trying to identify his Democratic administration with the Republican administration of Abraham Lincoln and with the Democratic administration of Thomas Jefferson. He builds the Lincoln, the Jefferson Memorial in the Tidal Basin of Washington. It's, it's dedicated in 1943. Uh, it's the thing you can see if you look out from the windows of the White House, Roosevelt, in his wheelchair could go and see the Jefferson Memorial and know that the statue of Jefferson was there. Um, that's, uh, those were appeals to history that were pretty powerful. And uh, I think that uh, great statesmen, effective statesmen, uh, effective politicians uh, can profit by helping to teach the public about things that uh, their schools may or may not have taught them much about. I said one political question, but there's going to be a second one before we get into uh -oh, the book. I uh -oh. promise we're going to get into the book. Does this, does this era, maybe just say decade, we'll confine ourselves to the decade, even though we're not quite halfway through the decade. Does this decade in the United States politically remind you of a particular decade? Does it remind me of a particular decade in American history? Um, I, you know, I'm tempted to say one of the decades in the post-Civil War period mm -hmm. where we have the idea that there are, uh, history has generally taught us that there are no heroes. The history of this period was written by the progressives and the robber barons. This was a book by the Marxist Matthew Josephson, very magazine writer. He was a vivid writer. I read that book when I was in college. 
uh, at Harvard. You know, they, they taught that one. Uh, well, robber barons, these people created industries that simply would not have been created if they hadn't been so clever. I mean, you know, John D. Rockefeller, uh, among other things that John D. Rockefeller did by establishing the oil business, he, he saved the whales because oil, whale oil had been used for interior lighting and he, uh, the major product of the oil business in the 19th century wasn't gasoline, we didn't have motor cars, it was kerosene that people used for kerosene lamps in the house. So, so you had great fortunes created out of whaling, as Moby Dick reminds us in the years before the Civil War and the mansions you can see today in Nantucket, although almost none of us can afford to buy one of them. Uh, but it, uh, you know, after the Civil War, uh, they're doing that. And John T. Rockefeller also created, really, the whole field of advanced medicine and medical research and, uh, and, and university hospitals and so forth. Medical research was created out of his fortune, deliberately by him. And, oh, yeah, he created the University of Chicago and that too. a bunch of other things, <clears throat> uh, Colonial Williamsburg, uh, he wasn't robbing anybody. Uh, he was uh, creating something, and then uh, both in his business and in philanthropy that contributed to human flourishing. Thank you for that. I want to uh, now we will get into the book. I promise, uh, entitled "Mental Maps of the Founders: How Geographic Imagination Guided America's Revolutionary Leaders." People who are tuning in via video can see the the book there. And, and I just finished this today, as I mentioned to you, as you arrived. Wow. It's really good. Oh, well, thank and, you. And I'm not merely being courteous and polite by saying that. It's really good. Well, thank you. Well, it's, uh, it was a fun project for me. And I could tell I, you had fun with it. Yeah, during the, you know, getting into the COVID period, one of the things I've done over the last 25 years, like many Americans, is to read all the great books about the founders. We had a whole series of, uh, of academic historians, uh, the colonial and revolutionary and early republic years, really uh, a whole cadre of really terrific people. Uh, and non-academic historians have done terrific books, the Ron Chernow and others, uh, first-class works and that have become public successes. I mean, Chernow's gotten rich off this. Well, I'm delighted to see that. Uh, he deserves it. And uh, I had read some of these, and I thought, well, I'd like to learn more about this. Um, and my, my old friend, Lou Cannon, the great reporter and Reagan biographer, Lou Cannon once said to me, if you want to really learn a lot about a subject, write a book about it. So I thought, well, what can I contribute? I'm a journalist. I've got a law degree way back in my, uh, my, my jagged past. Uh, I, you know, I... I've, I've read something about these. What unique contribution could I make? And I thought maps. Uh, I've always been a map buff. I've, I grew up in northwest Detroit where we had the square miles. I grew up uh, it, just south of Eight Mile, which is now famous, and seven and a half mile. And these square grids, the square mile grids that Thomas Jefferson actually proposed as a member of the Confederation Congress in the 1780s. Uh, and you can see them if you fly across the country. You can see them from uh, parts of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and so forth, west all the way to Orange County, California, if you've got a clear day on your flight, and uh, the and a window seat. Uh, and he, you know, it it, uh, it, it the maps and, and so forth. And I thought, well, let's look at at these people, how they saw the maps, because the 18th century, of course. They didn't have accurate maps of all of North America. They didn't know where things were. They also didn't have a concept of what it was a new nation. I mean, the revolutionary leaders did not sit down and say, well, the United States is going to go here, and New Jersey will be separated from Pennsylvania. By the, I mean, they, they did not have all this set up. They did not know what the limits of the new nation would be and what would be in it and what wouldn't. If you remember in 1775, one of the first things they do, they send uh, expeditions to Montreal and Quebec because they think that the French-speaking Catholics in Montreal and Quebec are going to want to join them. Uh-uh unsuccessful. Their generals, Montgomery Woefully dies. So. Yeah, yeah it, uh, <clears throat> uh, tragically and so forth. So 
um, it's it, they, they, they didn't know what was going on. So the geography, I thought, would be interesting. So I did more reading and research and with a view to try and draw up uh, their mental maps. And the result is this book, which is consists basically of six essays on six founders uh, about their mental maps and about the consequences this had for their leadership and the implications for what kind of a nation we became and what kind of a nation we hope we can make ourselves be. It's, you know, when I, when I saw the title of the book, and I, and I try to read a book before I read any reviews, the reviews have been very good, fittingly, I said, I think I know what he's, what he's getting at. And, and it was what you just described. But then when I started reading the book over the weekend, a few days ago, I thought, wow, he's, he's really starting with geography. And what, what, what clicked for me mentally was your story in the introduction about growing up in Northwest <laughs> Detroit. And, and you said, you know, almost verbatim, it would, the, the, living that out there, the square mile with roads that ran perfectly north, south, and east, west, you could learn the cardinal directions better than you could know left from right. Well, and if you, if, if you start with that concept, and you, the way I will describe it, obviously I'll ask you to, to describe this in your own words, and you put Benjamin Franklin in a particular spot and what he was seeing, for, for someone who's intrigued by this, what, what's novel about this, a real contribution to history, to our own understanding of our country as Americans, is that we really, through this book, get to see important events through the eyes of these founders using this concept of their mental maps. Well, thank you. I, it, I, it, I, it really is innovative. Well, it uh, it was one way to do it. I mean, Gordon Wood, um, I, whom I had met a number of times, uh, was one of the really last members of that generation. I think Gordon Wood is in his 90s now. Yeah. Uh, he's still active, still alert. And uh, I he asked him and gave me a blurb on this, and he said, uh, nobody else has actually looked at the founders in this particular way. So... I guess I was able to make a, a something of a unique contribution to a subject uh, which uh, can bear all sorts of study and and uh, and and reflection. Not bad for an attorney, political scientist, journalist. Well, just just another guy on the street. Yes, Michael Barone, you're just another guy on the street. You mind if I I read a few sentences of oh, your words? Oh, sure. This is terrific prose, by the way. You don't need right. to hear this from me, oh, but in an era when we don't see terrific prose, this is for, for people in the audience who play with right. writing, just listen to this. George Washington was not always the tight-lipped icon of the Gilbert Stuart portraits or the dazzlingly uniformed general mounted on a white steed. He was once a young man with red-brown hair from an outer corner of Virginia with limited prospects, a fine horseman with a knack for meticulous diary entries and precise calculations, the younger son of the second marriage of a Virginia planner whose death when he was 11 deprived him of the English education received by his older brothers. There was no indication that his early military exploits would bring him to the attention of one British king or that his leadership of a rebellion against his successor and his subsequent renunciation of power would lead that monarch to hail him as, quote, the greatest man in the world. Here's the punchline. This is the point about the mental maps. You continue. His accomplishments and his rise to fame owe much to the territory on the map which he always considered his home. From his birth in the narrow northern neck between northern Virginia's two great rivers to his boyhood home overlooking the Rappahannock and his mansion, Mount Vernon, overlooking the Potomac. This explains the book. It's also just a beautiful paragraph. Oh gosh, thank you very much. I, uh, well, I wanted to suggest a way of looking at George Washington. We always worry about his teeth and the Gilbert Stuart uh, portraits and so forth, and uh, and and to suggest that he, you know, he didn't start off as the first man in the country, uh, as first in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. He started off, um, you know, a privileged class, landowners and so forth, but uh, not from a fairly propitious thing. I mean, Thomas Jefferson actually started off uh, with a much better prospects uh, as an eldest son who inherited a whole lot of money early on and 
enough money to live comfortably for the rest of his life, basically, uh, and and so forth. So I, I wanted to get us in the minds of Washington. And I also suggest, as, as I get on in that chapter of George Washington, some of the contingencies that are involved there, some of the facts that almost accidents of history that make him come forward. Um, and the one of them is that, he, the, you know, his I mentioned the Rappahannock and the Potomac in that passage. Well, in fact, that land, as I explain on, is part of the, of the, of the Fairfax Grant. Lord Fairfax, the only British member of the House of Lords who lived in North America, uh, had owned this grant, uh, which was initiated by King Charles II in 1649 when he was in exile during the English Revolution and was didn't, didn't really have any power over it at all. He sold it to try and collect a little rent money, I think. Uh, and it, everything between the Rappahannock River and the Potomac River west from the Chesapeake to the source of the rivers in the mountains, a huge expanse of land. The three and a half million people live in that land. The greatest military force in the history of the world is headquartered there in the Pentagon. Uh, it's a pretty important hunk of land of, of 500,000 acres. Uh, and uh, Was that was Washington's homeland, the northern edge of Virginia. Uh, Lord Fairfax, and he, he, Washington's half-brother Lawrence marries into the Fairfax family, Fair, Lord Fairfax's grandniece, I believe. Uh, and the 17-year-old Washington comes, Lord Fairfax, having spent 11 years in the courts in London perfecting his grant against the locals in Virginia that wanted to challenge it, uh, hires George Washington to be a surveyor on his land. He's 17 years old. He's a good horseman. He's a meticulous guy. He's learning. He has a big temper, but he's learning to control it. And he's willing to go out in the wilderness and to survey things and to use all these cumbersome tools that they use for surveying. And you, and you go out when it gets cold. It, you don't want to survey when the tree leaves are all out in the summer. You don't go out till October, November, uh, and so forth. And he gets that frontier experience, which then commends itself to the House of Burgesses when they're looking for somebody to go warn the French not to advance into the forks of the Ohio, where the Allegheny and Monongahela rivers come together to form the Ohio River, site of Pittsburgh today. They send the 21-year-old George Washington up there. Uh, and of course, in the Second Continental Congress, 1775 is looking for a military commander. There is a member of the House of Burgesses of, uh, of Virginia in his uniform with the Fairfax County Militia, buff and blue, is George Washington, almost one of the very few colonials who had significant military experience. Uh, and he's appointed commander-in-chief. We get a Cincinnatus as our leader there, a man who will relinquish power who will resign a commission in the military and go back to being a private citizen, who will have, take, will be elected president unanimously and will voluntarily retire and return to his farm, and who at the last year of his life will scratch out on a piece of paper on his own, uh, in his own quill pen, uh, words which will free his slaves. Uh, and we get that kind of a man as a leader. That's a whole series of coincidence, and it, you know, it makes me think uh, Washington in his farewell address in Annapolis when he's resigning his military commission says, refers to, well, have we seen the interposition of providence here? Well, if you're a religious believer, you may believe, as Americans, many Americans believed over the years, that uh, somebody up there was looking out for us when we found this kind of a leader in this kind of unlikely setting. And it was the maps that did it, sending him out into the out beyond the Blue Ridge. He buys his first land in the Shenandoah Valley at age 18, sending him out to the forks of the Ohio within 15 miles of Lake Erie. Without the maps, without the need to improve the maps, we don't get George Washington as we know him. 
Well, we don't. And he had <clears throat> one of the maps that he took with him on one of these journeys. It wasn't very good beyond the first Appalachian chain was drawn by uh, two plantation owners who went out in the West themselves named Joshua Fry and Peter Jefferson, the father of Thomas Jefferson. Jeff, speaking of Peter Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson is, is one of the other chapters or focuses of the book, Benjamin Franklin. Any, any story from, from the three that we've mentioned, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, or the, the other three in the book that really surprised you, that's really stuck with you after finishing the book and publishing it? Well, one of the stories that surprises me uh, about you know, one of the stories that surprised me about Jefferson is that he wasn't much of a traveler. He loved maps. He didn't like traveling. And one thought I had was, well, actually, traveling was pretty darn inconvenient in the 17th century. If you had a nice house, you would do it. Uh, you would stay. You, you might want to stay home. Uh, Jefferson's father, Peter Jefferson, went out uh, to establish what's called the Fairfax Stone. I drove out to it. It's where the western tip of Maryland tips into West Virginia. It's the source of the north branch of the Potomac. He was surveying the western, one of the western ends of Lord the, Fair, the Fairfax Grant. It's called the Fairfax Stone. Nobody visits it. It's very unpop, not a popular tourist site. Uh, so, uh, you know, Jefferson, uh, Jefferson's father went farther west than Jefferson ever did. He very seldom in his life went west of the Blue Ridge, which you can see in Charlottesville. And it's remarkable when you step in, just brief interjection, when you step into the, 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 to Monticello, not only are you met with a lot of artwork and artifacts, but they're almost all from the American West. I mean, it's, it's a profound well, part he, of, he, of Jefferson's life. Yeah, he, he commissions other people to do this. He collects the maps. He collects the artifacts. So Monticello today, the way they've got it set up, he, you've got the artifacts that he was given by Lewis and Clark when they returned on their expedition, from their expedition that he sent them out on in 1804, uh, out through the Louisiana Territory and out to the West. Um, one of the things... One of the things that surprised me about Jefferson, I read through his notes on Virginia, a book that I had looked at before, but it never read systematically. And um, it's, it's, it's an it, it's interesting sort of compendium book. It starts off very dryly, but gets uh, very interesting. And he, uh, uh, he, 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 he has an adapted version of his father's map, the Jefferson Fry map, in the front, and which includes not only what is now Virginia, West Virginia, and Kentucky, which were part of Virginia then, but also much of Pennsylvania and everything. Uh, it, it doesn't really have much on the Atlantic coast. It doesn't include New York or West, New England at all. It's looking west. And in the notes of Virginia, he goes beyond the Mississippi River. He's writing in the 1780s when the Mississippi River has been accepted as the western boundary in the Treaty of Paris. He talks about, well, he, oh, there's this Missouri River that goes out there, and he starts describing what a big river the Missouri is, and then he tells his reader how many miles it is to go from Santa Fe to Mexico City. He gets it close to right. Um, at least on the roads as they exist, according to my Google Maps today. Uh, it's about 1,500 miles, something like that. He's, he's got that, he's, he's looking out towards the west. He's, he's, that's, his orientation is always to the west. So I mentioned earlier that he created that township plan, and we're going to have each township will be six square miles by six square miles. One of them will be devoted to paying for schools for public education and will uh, and this is followed in so much of the westward movement of of, of, Amer of in the Northwest Territory and otherwise going west uh, you know he, d he gets to the Louisiana Purchase but he sends Lewis and Clark all the way to the Pacific which is not included in the Louisiana Purchase uh, he is always interested in the West he's not interested in the seaboard at all he's that's not his turf. Uh, he, he, he foresees a republic of yeoman farmers who are, I think, uh, he expects to be deferential to the, the local big landlord like himself. Uh, he expected deference from other people, and he got it. Um, it's a contrast there that's very interesting. Alexander Hamilton, they're 
great antagonists in Washington's cabinet uh, and the founders, roughly, of what were functional equivalent political parties, which they said they hated. Uh, Hamilton has another phrase. Hamilton, at one point in his writing, says, um, if you look at the United States, he says, on your left side, is uh, British Canada and New England with the shipyards and so forth. On your right-hand side is Spanish Florida and the plantation colonies of the Carolinas and Georgia. Well, what are you looking at when New England is on your left and the Carolinas are on your right? You're looking out over the Atlantic Ocean. You're looking out at the invisible sea lanes that tied together the trading cities of the world, the cities of New York and London, Bristol, Glasgow, the British Isles, with the West Indies where Hamilton came from. And of course, uh, when you see him as a young man living in the horrible circumstances that he did, abandoned by the father, the mother dies, the guardian commits suicide. Uh, this is, I mean, talk about a dysfunctional youth. Uh, he's a clerk in an office for a couple of New York merchants. They go away for medical care. He, uh, he takes over at age 17. He orders ship captains to change their route. He collects debts that these guys had never been able to collect. He does uh, transactions in multiple currencies and figures out how to arbitrage. And, you know, he's brilliant. Yeah, he's, I, I compared him at one point with the almost, almost precise contemporary born about the same time, died young Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. It's a good comparison. They, they just could do things that you can't imagine a human being doing. And, uh, Ham but Hamilton sees, he, he mentions in his writing, Hamburg, the Hanseatic cities, Amsterdam, London, uh, the merchant cities in Florence. He sees the United States, which builds up a commercial and in time an industrial economy. Um, and remember, the 18th century was a time when, you know, when you look at those long-term economic growth things, there wasn't such a thing as economic growth. The idea, people's ideas was economies were kind of stagnant. Sometimes you, you know, got good years and then too many people were born and they, they didn't have enough to eat and you had bad years. Uh, Ma Thomas Malthus is writing about that circa 1802. Uh, just when economic growth in the English-speaking world and parts of Western Europe is suddenly accelerating. Hamilton sees that acceleration. He, he lived by it. He vibrates to it. He, uh, he wants the United States to participate in it. And uh, so that gives him a whole different perspective from Jefferson. Uh, and they see it kind of, they, you know, it, they're, of course, political opponents. Uh, and you can see why... Hamilton backs the National Bank. Why Hamilton backs the, uh, the, uh, the you know the, the national debt, the consolidation of the state debts, and uh, favors the report on manufacturers and so forth. Uh, why Jefferson is against all these things. Jefferson wants uh, you know to encourage the, the land in the West. Jefferson proposes a Northwest Territory without slavery, by the way, uh, which ultimately was passed by other people, but. Uh, 1787, but they, they're they different things. But you know, of course, what happens is we get a country that has both things. Imagine that. It's not quite what they wanted in either case. We're not quite as uh, commercial and, and, and loving of banks as, as Alexander Hamilton would like us to be. Uh, the yeoman farmers of the uh, West and the Southwest are not as deferential to their uh, nominal local superiors as Thomas Jefferson expected them to be. Uh, it, you know, uh, it doesn't turn out, but it, uh, it turns out that, uh, that we do develop in both ways, uh, that George Washington um, was wise to a point. You know, people don't think of George Washington as a hugely intelligent man, as a genius. You read about him, it becomes obvious he was a pretty smart guy. But he also, you know, he appoints Jefferson and Hamilton, who in many ways are his intellectual superior. Uh, in, I mean, 
Hamilton has this enormous knowledge. Uh, Jefferson, who dabbles in a lot of things, is a writer of transcendent genius. Is that all men are created equal? All that stuff. Boy, it shows it's beautifully this, done. And he's he, Washington is capable of hiring people that are that good. Exactly. That's, that's just what I was about to say, which shows his gift and his confidence as as a leader. So, is America better off? by having 200 years later, those two strains of thought in our politics? Well, yes. I mean, I, I you know, it's, uh, you know, you, you don't get to be a continental sized nation with 5% of the population, 25% of the economy, 50 plus percent of military capacity just by doing one thing. Uh, and, but, 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 but beyond that, I think it's it, one of the things that, that I got out of work on this book, and I tried to, and I put some of it, uh, these thoughts into it. Um, we were the happy result of a lot of contingencies that easily could not have happened. There are a lot of counterfactuals where things could have gone wrong. And the other thing is diversity. You know, we hear it talked about today oh, we're suddenly a diverse nation. We didn't used to be a diverse nation before. We were all just one kind of people. And I don't know. Um, the founders occasionally talk that way. But in fact, they knew we were dealing with a diverse nation. I mean, the collection of colonies. Uh, one of the things that Benjamin Franklin contributed that I think was not sufficiently appreciated by a lot of people today, maybe in history, He's one of the first ones that has an idea of the colonies having a unity. The being a unit is Albany plan of union in 1754, which was advanced to oppose the French conquering the Ohio Valley. Uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he actually, his biz, his, he created a business that transcended colonial lines. Poor Richard's Almanac, he was a printer in Philadelphia. His Poor Richard's Almanac was sold up and down the Atlantic Sea Coast and in the Sugar Islands of the Caribbean. Uh, he was, uh, he, he franchised his printing operations and got a share of the profits in other colonies. Um, but he also, he, he sponsored the evangelist, George Whitefield, uh, to have these monster rallies in the first, you know, you know the enlightenment of the, uh, the, the first enlightenment of the 1740s, became a friend of Whitefield's, even though he wasn't particularly religious conventionally himself. And, but Franklin has this idea that we're, we're gonna be one unit. And, but they also know New England was founded by Calvinists didn't welcome anybody else aside from Calvinists living there. It, they'd expel some of them. They went to, that's how you, how you got Rhode Island and New Haven as separate colonies. They were expelled from Massachusetts. Uh, you had uh, Virginia and South the Carolinas created by Anglicans. Um, the uh, Pennsylvania by Quakers. Maryland by Catholic, the, the Calvert family, Catholic proprietors. New York unruly New York created by the Dutch reform people, conquered by King James II as Duke of York after whom it's named. Uh, and so this, you know, it was a diverse country. They did not have to read David Hackett Fisher's Albion Seed, which it was published in 1989, a wonderful book that describes how different British folkways, all kinds of things were brought from different parts of the British Tremendous Islands. Tremendous book. Different parts of North America. But uh, they knew Albion's seed root and branch. Uh, they were very much aware of this. And so the whole project of creating a constitution, uh, James Madison has this insight that a large, you know, Montesquieu had taught that large republics didn't work. He just had city states. Republics only work for city states, maybe for the Dutch and Little Holland, uh, Little Swiss. Uh, there wasn't really a Swiss confederation then, and so forth. And, and, and Madison says, no, no, a large republic, a geographically large republic. And remember, the land they get out of the Treaty of Paris about the size of Western Europe. Uh, the, 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 a large republic can have, if it has a government that is limited in its powers, so there's room for local variation, and 
which um, has checks and balances so that you can't get temporary majorities just overwhelming everybody else and getting rid of their rights uh, and trampling on them. Uh, that this can uh, this can be a work or workable formula, and uh, the Constitution that he more than anybody else does to to set that up uh, does you know is is important in that way. It's it's genius. That's a perfect lead in to one last question. This has been a wonderful mm -hmm. conversation, and it's a it's a last question, Michael, about the modern day, and that is what needs to change about our politics, our society, heck, our understanding of the founding, in order for more Americans tomorrow to wake up hopeful about the American dream and the American future? Uh, I think one thing is to have, uh, for us to have a better developed sense of tragedy and of contingency, um, think about I've spent some time in Europe in the last few years, um, you know, and one of the things that, uh, that you do when you spend time in Europe is you think about what was happening there. Not so long ago, within the edge of my lifetime, the lifetime of some people still living who are older than I am, uh, and how many people were destroyed in what were very advanced civilizations. Uh, the elements of tragedy, the elements of contingency. I think if I, if I could convince Americans of one thing, I would say to you, you ought to have a sense of nationalism and national pride, not because you're wonderful, but because you are the lucky inheritors of a series of happy contingencies, a series of uh, great leadership and great creativity on the part of a lot of people, including uh, you know people outside of government and politics, people that none of us have ever heard of uh, or ever will hear of, that we have uh, we have a great responsibility in my view. Uh, I think really to the whole world. I know uh, some people, especially some conservatives today, will say. No, 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 uh, be that, but that we are lucky inheritors. And when we say we have national pride, it's not pride in our own achievement as individuals or as members of the baby boom or whatever generation you may claim to be a member of or something. Not maybe pride in what we've done lately. We see some mistakes. We uh, want it, you know, we argue about uh, what our government, what we should be doing in our private life, our private institutions. But we should have uh, a pride in, it. we should have a sense of how lucky we are. And that luck confers responsibility, doesn't it? It means that we have a responsibility to carry on the good parts, uh, the strengths of our heritage and of, uh, of the things that we have, uh, we have been the lucky <laughs> beneficiaries of, we should we should appreciate that more. We stand at a place in history, hugely privileged. It doesn't make us oppressors, by the way, but hugely privileged. But privileged uh, privilege means responsibility. Privilege means uh, not just you know the enjoyment of pleasure, but the performance of duty. And uh, I think we have uh, duties that are conferred upon us by the great deeds of our American past. Michael Barone, it was a real pleasure and honor to sit here with you. The book was fantastic. We look forward to having you back. Well, thank you very much, my gosh. I told you you would enjoy the conversation. I promise you, you will enjoy the book, Mental Maps of the Founders. And obviously, in Michael Barone's last comment, uh, we do have a duty as Americans, not just to keep smiling, but really to lean into institutions, into the responsibilities we have, the duties we have that, of course, are wedded to the freedoms we enjoy. We are going to restore this great country. Keep your chin up. Take care. The Kevin Roberts Show is brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. The executive producer is Crystal Kate Bonham. 
Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and Tim Kennedy. For more information and to subscribe, please visit heritage.org.